y'all, I have an announcement to make. I just got full marks on my product design at GCIC. For this part of the course, we were free to choose what we wanted to explore. And this was both a blessing and a curse because I had so many ideas. I knew I wanted to do something that wasn't necessarily functional, but that was about it. So for my research section, I decided to just go in and look at designers that I was interested by, and then I could take the highlights from those designers and merge them into my final product. By doing this research, I realized that I was much more interested in products that pushed the envelope of design thinking. Uh, for instance, Gaga's meat dress. I liked how it was controversial, it confronted the viewer, and it was also unexpected, and I wanted to include this in my design somehow. I was also interested in more structural design, like Isimiyaki's 1325 standard collection, and also this zigzag chair. I thought it all felt very angular, clean, and modern, and I was keen to imitate this. Up until this page, I had no clue what I was doing, but researching Philip Treacy and his hats was almost the glue that bound my project together. I vividly remember having the idea for the hat at about 3 a.m. and frantically searching for my sketchbook to try and scribble these sketches down. With the concept out of the way, the only problem that I faced now was how in the hell was I actually gonna make that hat? So I don't know if any of you guys have ever done professional hat making, probably not, but there's this thing called a milliner's block, which hat makers use to shape hats on. And we didn't have one at my school because like, I don't know what kind of school would stock a milliner's block in their product design department. So <laughs> I had to make one myself. From here on out, it was pretty smooth sailing actually. I just took the models that I'd made apart and then photocopied them to be two times as big. Just kind of making it up as I go, hoping that it would fit ahead in the end. Over the next few pages, I'm just evolving the designs of the individual pieces that will be cut out of metal and then folded and all riveted together. And with a lot of the pieces, I'd make up to six different versions of them. So I'd make a few card prototypes and then I made a polyprop prototype, which was much bigger. And then from that polyprop one, I made a template out of card, which I then stuck into my sketchbook when I was done with it. I'm not gonna go into too much detail on how I evolved my hat design in this video because that could make up a whole video on its own, but just know that it was a whole ass process. It took me so long to do. It honestly felt like I was James Dyson doing my 5,127 prototypes of a bagless vacuum cleaner, except instead of something that's functional and actually contributes to society, it was a metal hat. <laughs> The most challenging thing was attaching the pieces together. So I had a choice between pop riveting and traditional riveting. I eventually chose pop riveting because traditional riveting would have taken me maybe 40 hours more. It just wasn't worth the effort for me. And it also just looks nicer to pop rivet. So I don't know why traditional riveting is still around, but man, it was such a headache to get all of the holes and all of the pieces aligned correctly and to get the angles right and bro it was it was intense luckily time was on my side though because this wasn't the timed part of the course so i could take as long as i wanted to cut all of the aluminium pieces out i also did a few tests to see if annealing the aluminium would make it easier to fold but i found that it really didn't have much of an impact on the flexibility of the aluminium so i decided not to do it because that would have just added extra work on that i didn't really need at this point also because this process involved heating up the metal with a big ass blowgun, I wasn't too confident in my ability not to get burnt. So I decided to stay safe and not cause any fatal burn accidents. Anyway, here's the final metal hat. I like to think of it as my final prototype because there's still a few manufacturing errors, but if you don't look too closely at it, then it almost looks symmetrical. So I was happy to take that. 
it took me an absolute age to make this but I think it looks so impressive and I've honestly never seen anything like it so anyway this is the 60% I'm gonna take this off now because it's really heavy and then this great sketchbook is the 40% so let's get into it get into it Unlike the first part of the course in which I was free to create whatever I wanted, in the second part of the course we were given a list of briefs. So I think this was about 30 different things that we could design based off of, but the one that I was instantly inspired by was the wonders of nature because I thought I could do the most with that. So much like my first sketchbook, I started out with an ideas dump page and on it I jotted down everything that came into my head from the golden ratio to the ocean to the planets like everything was on there what i thought was the best idea was looking at the orbits of planets you know those interlocking circles my teacher also said that it would be much easier on me if i did a piece of jewelry at the end because this was a project that i could actually finish within that 10 hour exam despite having a really clear idea of what i wanted to do i still included some research because this is one of the four assessment objectives that we're examined on and i wanted to make sure that i got those marks for this part of the course. I knew that I was gonna end up using some sort of beads in my final piece. So I looked into tube crimps as a way to space the different beads along the necklace or bracelet. But I hadn't actually figured out what I wanted my beads to be like. So I did some research into different processes that I could possibly use to make those final beads. And then I dive straight in to making some prototypes. This first one turned out absolutely terribly. It was just too thick for a necklace. And then the second prototype is where it all got going. I figured out that any piece of jewellery that I made needed to be max one piece of acrylic thick and the technique that I've been using before of gluing three pieces of acrylic around a piece of wire just simply wasn't working. So I tried drilling through the side of the acrylic pieces. This method was a bit fiddly but I realised that I could make the individual pieces spin around each other almost like planets in a galaxy and this was the breaking point. This was my concept done. So I spent the next few pages trying to figure out how I was going to make this A aesthetically pleasing and B not fall apart the first time you put it on. My teacher also suggested that because my final piece was quite simple I should make a box to go with it so I wasn't just sitting there twiddling my thumbs in the final exam. And I'd recently become obsessed with those water modeling videos here on YouTube so this provided me with the perfect opportunity to include that water marbling in my final product. From there I'd made enough prototypes that I was almost happy to go into that exam and start working on my final piece. But the last thing that I did was I cut out all of my pieces for the final exam. And I know this kind of seems like I'm cheating, but technically I'm not. Educast, the exam board that I used, allows people to do all of the non-creative stuff for the exam. So this involves laser cutting out all of your pieces or cutting MDF boards to size and I took full advantage of this. Before I even went into the exam, I had all of my acrylic circles cut out for my jewellery in all my different colours. I had my box pieces cut out and taped together and I also had my little water marbling insert ready to go. I know that water marbling seems like a creative process but my teacher allowed me to do it and the exam board wasn't really checking. So to the best of my knowledge, I didn't actually cheat. Thank you very much, Educast examiner who's watching this. Anyway, here's my final prototype and I emphasize this is a prototype. There are still some laser cutter scorch marks and other minor details that I got wrong. But it was a good learning experience because therefore I wouldn't get those same things wrong in the actual exam. But the last thing that I did, and I'm so glad I did this, I wrote out a list of everything that I'd need to do in that final exam so I'd be able to reference it and this was a godsend. And then after 10 hours of that exam, 
This is what I made, if I can get it off the shelf. Um, here we go. I mean, what you order on live versus when it arrives. Like, come on, you can tell the difference. And this is designed so all of the different pieces can, in theory, spin around each other. And it just goes round your neck. Comes up. I did end up making some earrings with the spare time that I had in the exam, but I have no clue what happened to them. Like, everything went a bit manic when I moved schools, and uh, I think they just kind of got lost in the move. I realised that a lot of you guys might be watching this video in anticipation of your product design GCSE, so I've put together a few top tips that I wish somebody had told to me when I was starting out about two years ago. So number one, realise this ain't gonna be easy, child. It is definitely a commitment, like I filled two sketchbooks, did two final pieces, one 10 hour exam, loads of extra hours in the workshop, but I personally enjoyed it. So if you're willing to dedicate that, then great, dedicate that, but just be aware that it's gonna suck up a whole load of your free time. Tip two is to break down that work into smaller, manageable chunks. So for this great sketchbook, I set myself a target of doing one, two, three, four pages each week of the course. And that really worked for me, like it was in line with the amount of homework that I was getting set with other subjects. And I did feel like a little bit of a machine doing exactly four every week, but I got into the routine of it and it all paid off in the end, so. Free, document everything. Whenever you're prototyping, whenever you're trying something new, you take photos of it with your phone or with a camera, whatever, it doesn't have to be excellent quality. It's just so that you can show how your ideas have evolved because 25% of the final exam mark is for your final piece, whereas there's 75% for your build up and your evolution. So it's better to have a complete banging evolution and have a really bad final piece than do it the other way around. I also use this tiny grey sketchbook to do some kind of basic sketches and plans and drawings in. I didn't stick all of them into the final sketchbook but I did stick like the majority in. This really helped me because I didn't want my final sketchbook to be scruffy so this is the place where I could be scruffy and then I'd cut it up and put it into the polished sketchbook. The last thing that I'll say is it really helps to show the examiner all of the mistakes that you made and how you tried to overcome them and almost your design thinking. It's more about getting inside your head than making something amazing, I feel. But anyway, I'm sure you'll all do fine. Subscribe if you're new, leave me any questions you have down below and let me know what your final piece idea is as well. And I will see you all in the next video. Bye. Y'all, I have an announcement to make. I just got full marks on my product design. <laughs> <laughs> Y'all, I have an announcement to make. I just got full marks on my product design GCSE. You know, I had a product design like that in high school. <laughs>